Thank you for viewing this YouTube archive of a Conscious Consumer Network broadcast. Please feel free to share it far and wide. Check out our weekly broadcast guide for weekly updates on scheduled broadcasts. Help keep us on the air by contributing to our network support fund. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter or get in touch via email. We thank you for supporting free and independent media. This is For the Love of Learning, Voices of the Alternative Education Movement. Be inspired by the voices of visionaries, change makers, and ordinary, extraordinary people who do what they do all for the love of learning. This is For the Love of Learning, Voices of Alternative Education Movement. I am Miranda Ortiz de la Cajiga, and this is episode number 63. On this occasion, I have the privilege of substituting Lainey Liberty, the regular host, as she and her son Moreau are on team retreat in Cusco and Machu Picchu, Peru. In this episode, we're going to explore the importance of the parent-child relationship in effective unschooling and homeschooling, and in creating a better world overall. As a homeschooling parent myself, I am terribly excited and honored to be able to talk to our panel of experts on this topic. Still, I think that even when parents choose to educate in institutional settings, there is much to be gained by scrutinizing and perhaps adjusting the parent-child relationship in order to provide the best and most fertile ground for development. Our panel of experts today will weigh in on the hows and whys of living in partnership paradigm with the children in our lives. I'm going to give a brief introduction of each of our panelists, and then we'll start the conversation. Although these introductions are brief, we have more information about each of them on the show notes page, which you can find at the Conscious Consumer Network TV. Look for the show notes page for episode number 63, where you will find more extensive information about each of the panelists, as well as links to their projects and websites. So with that, and in no particular order, let me first introduce Teresa Graham Barrett. Teresa lives her passion for creating social change by combining her work in social justice education with parenting. After graduating from law school, she opted to serve the, for causes of social change as an advocate, educator, and leader in three public universities across the United States. When she became a parent, she realized that in spite of her personal and professional values, she had accepted, without question, the dominant cultural beliefs that adults have the right to control and coerce children. Using her experience in facilitating transformative learning and intergroup dialogue, she began her own intensive journey of learning. This led her to a deeper understanding that the ways our society treats kids sets the foundation for all other forms of injustices. As a writer and a consultant, she works with other parents to do inner work as the foundation for the outer action that ultimately liberates individuals, groups, and communities. Our second guest, Sura Hart, is an internationally recognized trainer with the Global Center for Nonviolent Communication and is the contact person for projects integrating nonviolent communication into the U.S. school systems. This is powerful, as most children are still being educated within the traditional school system, and so her work has the possibility of touching many, many lives. She designs curricula and facilitates training for students, parents, teachers, and school administrators around the globe. 
Sura is also the co-founder and lead trainer of an annual six-day Center for Nonviolent Communication Educators Institute, Teachers for Life Retreat. In addition, she has co-written several books, amongst which is Respectful Parents, Respectful Kids, Seven Keys to Turn Family Conflict into Cooperation, which speaks directly to our theme today. She also co-created a game called The No Fault Zone, which we'll be asking her about. And finally, Robin Grill, a psychologist in private practice and a parenting educator. His articles on parenting and child development have been widely published and translated in Australia and around the world. Robin's first book, Parenting for a Peaceful World, has received international acclaim and led to speaking engagements around Australia, the US, the UK, New Zealand, and Canada. His second book, Heart to Heart Parenting, is now translated into Korean and German. Robin's work is animated by his belief that humanity's future is largely dependent on the way we collectively relate to our children. Robin's experiential skill-based informational parenting courses have helped many people to embrace parenting as a transformative personal growth journey. Drawing from 25 years of clinical experience from leading edge neuropsychological research, Robin's seminars and courses focus on healthy emotional development of children as well as parents while building supportive, cooperative, co cooperative parenting communities. So these are the fantastic guests that we are going to be able to meet today. And so with that, I would like to start the conversation by asking Teresa to tell us a little bit about her journey, her personal journey, which she described so candidly, of how in spite of the way that she had refocused much other aspects of her life, when she had her first child, she stumbled upon certain beliefs that she was holding that she still decided later to let go of. So, Teresa, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? I would. Thank you, um, Miranda. I'm excited to be a part of the show today and to talk with the other guests as well. And, you know, as, as I um, reflect on my own personal journey as a parent, um, you know, often there are these moments where you like the light bulb goes off, there's an aha moment. For me, it actually was um, a bit of a process, but also one of those moments when um, it actually happened around the time when I was pregnant with the second child in my life, and my partner had um, taken some home videos. I happened to end up watching one of those videos and saw myself interacting with the first child in my life, Martel, who we'll see later, later um, in a video where he and I are conversing. And it was in that video that I watched myself interact with him and my conception of who I thought I was as a parent and the reality of how I treated him, I was struck um, with the huge contrast by watching that video and how I spoke with him. And in spite of my belief in justice and respect and all of those things, I realized in that moment that I had um, become a really controlling and um, coercive parent, or I had been all along in many ways, even though I practiced attachment parenting, but it was at that moment that I began to question how it is I came to the point where I believed that he owed me respect, but I didn't owe him any respect, and that I really didn't treat him very respectfully or honor his personhood or autonomy. And so that began my process of trying to understand how it was I came to that place of believing in equity and justice around other identities, but never questioning how it is our culture and our society treats children and views children as less than, certainly less than adults, but at times often I think less than human um, with human rights. And that was part of my personal journey. I think that that's an experience that a lot of us as parents at some point go through or start to reflect on ourselves vis-a-vis um, -vis that child that we're now confronted with. Definitely, I think parenting is a big growth experience if we allow it to be. Um, in that respect, Sura, I know that you've got some thoughts on the role of parents. Sura, yeah. can you, are you there? Yeah, thank you. It took me a minute to unmute. Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, I just, I resonate with everything Teresa was saying about, uh, well, how many of us had any kind of training in parenting? You know, I didn't. And it's, it's always surprising to me the hubris or whatever it is that 
has us believing we know things that we really don't know about. So I hadn't really investigated parenting. All I had were the models I had and what I you know, saw around me in the culture. And that's what came through with my early parenting as well. And I heard myself saying things that shocked me, um, being controlling and like Teresa was saying, not really respecting these human beings that had come into my life that I now just see are such gifts if we can learn to um, really see them, listen to them, respect them, rather than think we are the policemen for them, basically. So, yeah. Um, so that's why I go back to this question, and it's often how I start my parenting uh, workshops is, you know, what is your purpose in parenting? How do you define that for yourself. And a related question I found helpful is, you know, what kind of people are you hoping your children will grow up to be? And once people have answered those two questions that I find most people haven't even asked before, they often have what is sort of a recipe for, well, since children learn the most from how we live and how we show up, we have a little uh, map here. How do I demonstrate the honesty I'd like to see in them? How do I demonstrate the, you know, thinking for myself, the integrity, the authenticity I want to see in them? Uh, how do I do that to be the model for them? So that, that is where I like to start is questioning our assumptions about what our role is as a parent. Oh, Miranda, I can't hear you. There we go. Sorry, getting a hold of the software myself as well. Um, sir, that's really interesting, and it makes me wonder, because both you and Robin are actually working with parents in parenting, uh, parenting and coaching of parents, when they first come to you and you do that exercise, what are the answers that they're normally coming up with? What do they, You mentioned that perhaps they haven't even posed the question to themselves. So I'm, I'm curious as to how they feel about that question. If they have posed it to themselves, what answers you are seeing before they start the workshops and perhaps how that transforms? Uh, you know, what I usually see are parents coming up with the same values um, that they want to see in their children, honesty and integrity, thinking for themselves, not following orders, um, listening to their inner voice, their inner wisdom. Um, uh, being okay with making mistakes, you know, these are the kinds of values that I find most parenting parents hold, similar all over the world, really. But then when they look at how they parent and see if that is actually leading those their children in the way that they want to go, I think there's a lot of surprise and shock. And also, when they are asked, when I ask them to take a look at themselves and ha what, what can they do specifically, what are they doing uh, to acknowledge and celebrate that, what more could they be doing to model those values, that's where the real work begins that is often hasn't, hasn't begun with a lot of parents. They're very busy, you know, doing the things they're supposed to do, they think they're supposed to do, and, and are, uh, just haven't given it that kind of introspection and and self-reflection. So uh, for me, that's super valuable um, time spent. And if we spend the whole day on that, I think it's, it's, it's time well spent, even though, I mean, I haven't imparted any of my, the many wisdoms I have. Um, I think that's less important than giving people the opportunity to slow down and take a moment to reflect in those ways. Interesting. So I guess the base point is maybe starting to look introspectively as parents at ourselves. Uh, Teresa, you've got something you'd like to add to that. Well, Sarah's comments reminded me of some of my own journey around, um, I, knew, I knew my first child was going to be a boy, so I started thinking about issues like sexism and, um, you know, working in higher education around sexual assault and consent and just all of the things that were sort of in my world at the time. And what it reminded me of was that I had these beliefs that I wanted him to take on about being um, <clears throat> not sexist and, you know, treating um, others with respect. And the irony for me, I think, in my own learning journey as a parent was that even though I hoped that he would adopt these values, 
all of my behaviors toward him actually led in the opposite direction because in so many ways I didn't listen to his voice. I didn't ask him for consent. I didn't respect his integrity. And so all, in so, so many ways I had these values and yet my behaviors were often in direct contrast to let me teach you how you need to be, but I'm not going to treat you in the way that I want you to treat others. Anyway, I just just reflected on that and, and I'm sure um, others have things to add to that, but um, that was what Sir's comments um, made me reflect on. Sure, Teresa. I think that Mary, many, many parents go through this journey that you're expressing. Now, I know Robin's got some thoughts that he'd like to share on this. Joe Robin? Your microphone? Remember to unmute. <laughs> Robin, <laughs> unmute, please. Yeah. There you go. Okay, am I here? <laughs> yeah, you're on. We're all, we're all uh, looking like beginners, aren't we, with the microphones, etc. But it's, it's great to be with you, Miranda, and everybody, and um, Sarah and, and Teresa, and um, I look at very, very stimulating stuff that you're all talking about. And I, um, um, it, looking at the history of parenting, which is something that I was so fascinated with and studied for a while, um, uh, one way that I have a framing uh, collective story right now is that it seems to be a lot of our cultures are trying to learn how to move from an authoritarian model of what parenting and, uh, and teaching means to a, a whole different structure for, for connection. I'd, I like to use the, uh, the term connection um, as a, um, a kind of a frame um, in the sense that we're, I think we're trying to learn how to move from a control paradigm to a connection paradigm. Um, you know, to put it in an oversimplified way, uh, the, the, you, you could characterize as old styles of parenting that we, most of us tend to come from, as very preoccupied with um, a sense that your child would naturally, naturally be wild. This, is, this, by the way, says a lot f about what the old beliefs were about what a human child is. You know, the original sin kind of factor that, you know, unless we control this essentially antisocial child, this child would not become a socially respectful, loving and contributing human being. So that kind of frames the parent's place as one primarily of controlling and restricting and inhibiting this kind of basically toxic uh, expectation of, uh, you know, misbehavior. And that already primes our experience of our children in a, in a particular way. And it's, I think it's very sobering to consider just how much uh, that uh, sense has um, permeated, you know, the assumptions of our relationships with our elders when we're children. And so, you know, as we move, you know, without fantastic role models, most of us, uh, in, into having our own children and, and looking after, if we're teachers, potentially other people's children as well. Um, it's not surprising to me that for as much as we, we, we have new beliefs about the values that we want to bring, you know, under stress and when we're feeling overwhelmed, you know, it, it, we're likely to sound, I think this happens universally, you know, I get the same story no matter where we go in the world, we're likely to sound... Um, very similar to, to the very thing that our parents did or our school teachers did that we didn't like when we we're under stress. So, um, um, you know, there's a lot of self-supervision and a lot of self-correction that, that, that is, uh, is, is of great value to us, I think. That, uh, I, I, what I find really reassuring, and I, I like to say this a lot to parents that I work with in my workshops, that it, it doesn't even though sometimes we will, we will breach that sense of respect, you know, we will be controlling in a toxic way, for instance, and reflect the kind of authoritarian structures that come from our own histories, right? That it doesn't end there. The damage doesn't, it's not a closed book. It's not so much what we do, but what we do afterwards. The relationship keeps going. And there is, um, I really, really encourage myself and the parents that I work with to then come back for a talking stick kind of scenario afterwards 
and to ask the child for the feedback. How did that feel for you when I was when I spoke to you in that way? Um, and some honest self feedback about ourselves, which includes saying, "Look, I'm I really overreacted back then, and I was overbearing, and I don't like when I do that, and I felt a bit out of control, and I'm interested in how I, that made you feel." And I think that those kinds of correcting conversations really allow for the fact that every family will be a mess and that it doesn't end with the mess. The great growth and the great coming back to love is to, is to have those afterwards conversations, um, which then gives our children a wonderful platform for understanding that even when things are a mess, this is what it looks like. This is the kind of thing that we can do to unmess the mess and to come back to connection. Uh, that's why my favorite paradigm here is connection, to seek to connect rather than to seek to control. Even though, you know, sometimes we need to control things if there's a terrible, in an emergency, okay, someone's about to run across a busy highway. But, but generally speaking, for me, the paradigm is about connection and a lot of good things flow from that. Just very, very quickly, what I mean by connection is that beautiful feeling of intimacy and closeness um, and, um, that comes from that uh, mutually open dialogue between us and our children when we're both striving to be, um, let's call it emotionally authentic, when we're speaking the truth of how we feel. There's something about the commu how we communicate emotion to one another, I think, is the, is the fundamental driving force of um, ultimately all of those good values that we claim that we want about um, loving children, respectful children, uh, self-assured children who don't just do as they're told, but they you know, listen to their own feelings. Um, so, look, I could say so much about that. I don't want to speak too long. Uh, Robin, that is just fantastic, and it requires an incredible amount of vulnerability from the parent in order to say, I'm not in control of my emotions, perhaps I didn't react properly, and that in itself is a, it, that in itself is a dynamic which will automatically start to break apart that authoritarianism that is normally what we are used to in the adult and child relationship. Uh, Sura, I think that you've got something about authoritarian practices that you'd like to share with us. Remember to unmute. Have you unmuted? There yeah, you go. Thank you. It's taking me a moment here. Um, well, so many subjects are intertwined here, and Robin brought up a number of them. So, um, they're, they're, these authoritarian practices certainly have had me looking at why. Why did we think that was necessary? And I agree with what you said, Robin, that you know, it tends to stem from a belief that we're bad, selfish people, and we need to control others, and especially these children, when... I don't find that to be true, um, you know, of these young children. They're full of desire to give and love. And um, my teacher in nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg, said he believed that contribution and giving to one another was the, the greatest joy there was. And I see that for myself, and I see that in my five-year-old grandson. I, saw it in, I see it in children everywhere. They love to love. So it's the natural thing and that selfishness and all the other, I think, actually, we cultivate in a culture that doesn't um, see that, honor it, and that distrusts um, people, including our children. So that's a very interesting and kind of a naughty question, you know, as in K-N-O-T-T-Y, to unravel about people's belief in human nature. I think it stems from that. But um, I'm much more interested, actually, to talk, in what, uh, talk about what you said um, about connection and um, dialogue and openness. And for me, honesty is in there. How do we be, I want to be honest with people about my values, my strivings, my intentions. And so for me, that honesty in relation to children looks like I'm just learning. You know, this is a new opportunity for me to learn and love in this family. I've never been here before. I have ideas. I have experiences. But 
here's here's my intention. My intention is to to have mutual respect, to respect everybody here, to listen, to learn, and uh, I, I don't have all the answers, and certainly not in this group that we're just learning about each other and it's changing all the time. So I'd like to say that my intention is to love and respect you and listen to you and get to know you. And if you ever question that or see actions of mine that don't uh, express that to you, please let me know because I'm just learning too. So that level of vulnerability and honesty is what excites me about all relationships, including our relationship with our children. And in a certain sense, for me, authentic parenting maybe is what I resonate with the most, living and learning with our children in an authentic way and just finding out what, what we can learn about life together. So I think that's more interesting to me in the moment and more vital, you know, more resonant in my heart than looking at ancient paradigms of sinfulness, which I think really do have uh, – do run that authoritarian approach to life control. Anyway, that's, that's, that's where what you said led me uh, to Robin. And I, I just love talking about that connection and love. And uh, as again, my teacher, Marshall Rosenberg used to say, it's not something we really have to teach people. It's, it's touching into that place that's already in us that wants to love and wants to connect and wants to see each other with a great deal of respect. Thank you very much, Sarah. Those are fantastic thoughts. I want to take us back a little bit, though, because although this panel obviously working in this area, we're going to have a lot of common ground. The brunt of society, the fact that you guys are all working on the issues that you're working at is because most of society is not at the place where you guys are at. So I'd like your thoughts, and I'd like as a basis for the rest of our conversation, to look a little bit about what in our society, not so far back as the original sin, but what in our contemporary society is making things such that we have this feeling that we need to control kids. And perhaps I want to let you know that I'm coming at this from having worked in traditional communities around the world, where if you're working in communities that are non-Western, you often find that the kids aren't receiving the same level or the same type of coercion. So there's certain things in the Western world, which is where we're all based, the four of us here, uh, that are actually leading specifically in that direction. I don't know if this rings any bells with any of you. Robin, I see you uh, nodding. Would you like to chime in on that thought? Uh, yes, I think, uh, look, there, there, is, there is a fast-growing kind of social evolution going around the world where more and more people are really getting it in their bones that the old uh, story of do as you're told because I'm, I'm older and, and, um, and do as you're told uh, or else, there's a vast growing conviction that that is suspect, okay? And um, uh, people are working very hard to move away from that. I see that in so many kind of uh, 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 circles of, of life. Um, one example of that is that there are now about 50 nations around the world where it's against the law for a parent to strike a child so that that's classified as domestic violence and that there are over 50 further nations that are in process legally to, to um, take away that, that defense of um, you know, what they call reasonable chastisement and that there are about 120 nations now where it's against the law for uh, a teacher or educator to strike a child physically. So there's definitely a movement away from the, the, um, the worst excesses of authoritarianism and, and a growing understanding that if we want a democratic society, democracy begins at home. You can't have it, you will not get the democratic impulse in people by being a, a dictator at home or in school. Uh, so we're all trying to, I guess, voluntarily learn to do that. But one of the things that really concerns me is that, you know, as we move away from uh, the overt aspects of punishment and shaming of children, which is just another uh, a very injurious kind of practice, shaming, by sh shaming is what happens when we, when we describe a child to that child, when we speak to them in terms of you are. And every language is loaded with, with that you statement 
you know, you're naughty, um, etc., etc., etc. Um, what do we call it? The terrible twos and little monsters and blah blah. So as we try to move away from punishment and shaming, what one thing that has begun to emerge is um, what I would call a third force in authoritarianism, which is to manipulate. And people have begun to, um, it's still not about connection, people have begun to buy uh, the kind of behaviour they want from their children. Um, for instance, in Australian schools, they, they give out prizes for, um, you know, little gold stars. They don't ask, what would you like to read? What interests you? Where are your passions? They say, if you read this, you'll get a gold star. They don't ask, why are you talking in class? They say, if you stop talking in class, you will get a gold star. And that's, still, that's the reverse, the flip side of authoritarianism. We're manipulating. And that kind of idea is being sold en masse by psychologists uh, to schools all over Australia. It is absolutely the dominant paradigm. I don't know exactly how that is in, in, in North America um, or other parts of the world. Um, it's a kind of a soft authoritarianism that still avoids making, taking the moment to make a real connection with the child in the way that Sura was saying, that emo uh, emotionally authentic dialogue with the child that ultimately has, is the most effective uh, force for, for change and influence. If we tell the truth, we do want as elders collectively to be an influence upon our children. Absolutely, we want that. It's not a free-for-all kind of permissive intention. We want to influence in a loving and respectful uh, direction. But I always remember, fundamentally, I, I never ever did what I was told other than, you know, um, subversively. Um, if I did, I never ever meant it. Not once. It was always an automatic... I think the, the democratic impulse, by the way, is biological, and if you, if you want me to speak to that later on, I, I, I can. But I always felt as a child and as a teenager an immediate resistance to being told what to do, so I never ever did what I was told. However, I was deeply influenced by my elders, and, and the way that my parents influenced me in a way that I still hold and still is part of who I am and that I really embrace that, is in how they behaved and how they connected with me and what they said that they meant from their heart. They could do in one sentence what they could not do in a million sentences, if you understand what I mean. I'll give you one example. My father told me a million times, study harder, work harder, don't slacken off with your school and your university, blah, blah. It, it, I always fought with that. But when he said one time and only one time, and he said it from a place where I could really see in his body language, in his eyes, in the tone of his voice, this came from the back of his heart. He meant it with every cell in his, his body. He said, you know, really the reason why I really want you to pursue your studies, I, I just... I know what it feels like to wake up every morning and to look forward to my work because I love my work. I want you to have the same experience with whatever you do. Bam! That went in. I've been living that way for the rest of my life. And he said it once. But it came from his truth. That's kind of, you know, that's a different way we need to language that. It's a different kind of influence. It's not teaching so much, but being. It's more about being and connecting. That is very profound, Robin. Thank you. That, that story is beautiful and very, very clear. Um, now, it strikes me as interesting that a lot of what we're talking about, especially when we talk about authoritarianism and shaming, that, as read from the child's perspective, is going to have a lot to do with fear versus safety. Now, I know, Teresa, you've got some thoughts on that that perhaps you could share with us. One of the things that I, um, is of particular interest, both in the work that I do in universities, but also the work with parents, has been to look at 
Um, and Robin talked a little bit about this at one point when he said, when we're under stress, and what happens when we're under stress as parents or as individuals, it doesn't matter whether it's adults and children or across race or gender. But I think one of the things that um, I think is really challenging is I can have my intent and my values and want to treat others with respect. And yet the challenge is when I in particular experience um, fear or I don't feel safe, which can come from a number of things as an individual from my own past experiences of being controlled by parents, by my own parents and in systems, is that then I react by needing to control. And so I think in some ways, um, you know, understanding our own journey and connection around experiences of being in systems that are authoritarian and where control is the norm, whether it's educational systems, family systems, legal systems, whatever it might be, I think what that leads to is these automatic reactions that we have. Because when we don't have control over our lives or aspects of our lives, none of us have total control over everything around us. Um, but when we don't have control, we don't necessarily feel safe. Um, when we feel like adults can act upon us or systems can act upon us without our consent and control what we do, it's possible that we weren't safe as children, um, both in our families and in whatever systems we're a part of. So I think one of the challenges that I always think about as a parent is, what are the patterns of thinking? What are the mental models? Even what are those neural pathways that get activated in me or in parents when a child reflects back to us that lack of control? So I then react by controlling because in that moment, it's not the child in front of me. It's someone else who is, tri it's, it's that adult who I was afraid of or, or a situation where I didn't feel safe and my only reaction is to control it. And so I, I think in some ways there's both the systemic issues around how it is we shift paradigms, we create more mutual um, learning environments, we look at how systems use power and dominance, but also then how we've internalized that power and dominance and we use that to mask our fear and to feel safe and to feel in control. And we do that by controlling others who are less powerful than us. Those are, again, fantastic and terribly deep thoughts because, again, it puts the adult who is supposed to be, or we tell ourselves that we're supposed to be in a position of being the one to teach. And really what all of you guys are pointing out is that we're in a position where we really have some heavy learning to do in order to unteach ourselves the things that we have learned within our lives. Uh, that both from the social structures, as I'm understanding that everybody's talking about, but also just our own positions of fear in our own life. Because we might be, as you're saying, Teresa, reflecting not upon the child, but perhaps upon our parents in the past or our boss today. Exactly. And those power and dominance is such a part of our work structures, our school structures, everything else that we're operating within those so often that to move out, as um, Sura talks about in, and Robin have talked about into that partnership paradigm or in that connection and really sort of living up to our highest aspirations. In some ways, it's easier when we're not in conflict, when we're not under stress, and then it's that's when it's most difficult, is when we're under stress, when we feel unsafe, when we're in conflict with others. Absolutely, and I think parents, especially parents who are currently parenting, and uh, often we'll find that the, the moments of stress and the moments where we react badly are when we're in stress within the rest of our life, or very poignantly, simply when we have something to get to, and we have to do things fast, and the child is just thinking about something else, and this is where that coercive, that uh, authoritarian structure just comes out because we've got a goal to meet, and that goal has nothing to do with where that child is mentally and where they're wanting to go. Um, now, we talked in the introduction a little bit about how the topic on uh, for the podcast today is about the child-adult relationship and how that can change in our education, but also how that can change the world. Now, what you're saying to me speaks directly to that theme, because if we can start to unbuckle these structures within our child-adult relations, 
we're going to start unbuckling some heavy structures in our world. I don't know if any of you have some thoughts on that. Uh, sure, I think you've got an idea that you'd like to share. Sarah? I know it takes a couple of clicks for me to unmute. Um, yeah, just just uh, hearing what you said, Teresa, about the times when we are out of control or feeling afraid or and then we react and, well, the only way maybe we know is to uh, project that out on the child in, in particular. But for me, again, the learning journey is being honest to ourselves and to our children that we're learning how to take care of you know sometimes we have angry outbursts sometimes we say things we wish we hadn't said and uh, I found children are really really relieved and calmed to hear us um, be vulnerable about that and to share our, our learning journey about that and to you know in, in, in our book our parenting book we talk about taking a time in you don't put the child out but we model, and teachers can model this, that there are times, kids, when I get stressed and, you know, I just, I just haven't had enough sleep last night or many reasons. You know, let's talk about the different reasons we each get stressed and what we, can, what we can do to self-manage. So that, to me, that's one of the most important learnings in a family or a school you could have is to open up that conversation that adults and children are learning how to successfully, more and more successfully manage our emotions so that we aren't lashing out at other people. And when I do it, um, I'm going to notice that. And, um, and you know, it, it happened to me not too long ago with my five-year-old grandson. He was four at the time, actually, and he just all of a sudden, his energy went out and he went and pounded on my laptop. And it freaked me out. I, I was scared he was going to hurt it. I'd never seen him do anything like that before. And I went over and I picked him up and I not too gently put him, took him over to the sofa and put him down. I then composed myself and, um, you know, said, gosh, you know, I guess that energy just came out of you. To, you know, I didn't say bad boy, you can't do that. Don't ever touch my computer again. That's typical punitive words out of a parent's mouth, but I have learned to, to see that we're all doing the best we can. He wasn't trying to hurt me or hurt it. Something just came over him, and I can appreciate that. And then I, I immediately said, I am so sorry to hold you so roughly. It's not the way I want to hold you. And he was just like, you know, we were just looking at each other. I was down at his level, and, you know, I'm guessing you didn't mean to hurt the computer. I was scared you would, though, and that's, I was, I reacted out of that fear. And I really don't want to do that. And he totally got that apology. And that's so rarely done from a parent to a child, you know. And from and then, you know, I also knew better than to do what I used to do, which is now say you're sorry and you won't ever do it again. And, you know, treating him like, you know, but I knew, I could tell from what, how he looked at me that he felt bad about the whole thing. And, and he also felt safe to talk to me because I wasn't making him a bad person. Um, and I wasn't going to punish him. And he just looked up at me and he said, "Nah, I'm sorry I hit your computer because that's important. You use it for work and play. And I, I, did, I don't want to hurt it. I said, I know you don't. I know you don't. So and thank you for hearing my apology that I don't want to treat you roughly ever. So we can be learning together how to get along, how to make mistakes, how to like you were saying, those, those correcting conversations, Robin, to come back and say, you know what I wish I would have said instead of what I did? You know, and that's, I mean, huge learning there. And we often just don't think we have the time to, you know, review and come back and create the connection after it's been broken momentarily. So uh, for me, that's just precious learning um, in all my relationships and, and, and with my grandson, for sure. That's a fantastic and fantastically different uh, way of attending such a situation. And again, the vulnerability comes right out. I think that that seems to be, for me, what I'm picking up on is that that's a theme. You make yourself vulnerable, which is not what our parents taught us a few generations back. And in making yourself vulnerable, you open up that uh, connection with the child. 
Now, Sura, the game that you made as you're talking about this, it's, it strikes me that perhaps this is the kind of tool that could be used when you're trying to make these connections. Could you tell us a little bit about the game, how it works, how you've employed it, maybe how parents and, and kids can use it? Yeah, it's being used in a lot of really fun ways. I just came back from a month in China where it's been translated, and uh, we had a lot of fun with it there, too. Um, uh, to begin with, we called it the No Fault Zone game, and uh, the last chapter in our parenting book is Make Your Home a No Fault Zone. And what we mean by that is what I have learned from my teacher, Marshall Rosenberg, this idea that every moment we're all doing the best we can with what we know, with where, where, our, where our, uh, you know, emotional system is, where, what's going on in our amygdala, what had just happened with our amount of rest, all the very factors. We're doing the best we can to meet a set of universal human needs. And just to see the possibility that that's actually true takes away uh, the old habits for me of seeing that people, thinking that people are doing wrong or bad or shouldn't or all those things that put other people into a category of blame and start that blame game. So the no fault zone refers to this space where we see each other as human making mistakes, but not, you know, without malice and, and unless, you know, we've been so harmed that, you know, that's all that, that comes out at that moment. And even then there's a tenderness and compassion for, you know, what, when people hurt each other, you know, when, <laughs> anyway, I could say a lot about that, but the game itself is, um, is a hands-on tangible way to have these kinds of connecting conversations, whether it's to share uh, appreciations or to work out problems and conflicts. So there's a mat, there's, car there's cards that uh, represent or express feelings and needs, our internal state, and it provides people with vocabulary that they might not otherwise have ready access to about what's important to them, uh, how they're feeling. They might not have many emotional terms like when I first came into this work with nonviolent communication, mad, sad, glad, and frustrated were, were pretty much the extent of my <laughs> emotional vocabulary. So it, it actually puts in people's hands this vocabulary and it steers them in this direction of talking not about what they think of each other or who's to blame, but actually directs them through the card play into this, this, this no-fault zone where we're just talking about how each of us is, what's important to us, and what we might like different. So it, it's, it steers clear of the, the blaming and complaining. And, <clears throat> uh, you know, you can see it on our website. And I always find it a little challenging to try and sum it up in a few words. So I'm wondering if that description does anything for you, Miranda. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I do want to point the audience to the fact that there is a link on the website to the web page so they can actually see it. Uh, what I found really interesting in the tool itself is that it puts a physical thing between you and the situation. And so it gives you the cards to work with. And especially if you're in a situation where you, I think you're having a hard moment and you're reacting, and if you don't have the language, it actually puts it physically in your hands. So that would be a very disarming uh, tool, which I found very interesting in that regard. Now, I want to flip over to Teresa for a sec. Um, and I want to bring out the idea of the reflective learning and the process that's important in our relationships, Teresa, because I think that we're all touching upon this. Well, Sarah's comment about reconnecting with her grandson, um, I think one of the things that that reminded me of is just that critically reflective process that when something has happened often, um, I think what we often learn is to just move on as quickly as possible from it because we're uncomfortable and we avoid conflict or discomfort or it's, as you said, Sarah, how often did we hear parents apologize or come back and want to reconnect? It's not something that's modeled. Um, in our society and our structures and our systems and um, 
what it made me think about was some of the reading that I've done, um, you know, Dan Siegel's work, who does a lot um, in terms of neuroscience and mind sight tools of just how it is when we can critically reflect and understand how we came to the place where we're at and then begin to create um, different ways of thinking and reacting and behaving. We can actually rewire those responses or reactions um, in different ways that our brains are very um, you know, flexible at no matter what age we are and that we can, you know, even as Robin talked about it in the parent-child relationship within ourselves, even begin to um, create different pathways for how we react, how we see situations, you know, the tools of the um, nonviolent communication. There's just so many ways in which that critical reflection, coming back and connecting, not only do that for the parent-child relationship, they actually can impact us as individuals and really help us to understand how we move beyond the um, experiences or perhaps trauma that we experienced um, in our own lives to a different way of coming into those relationships. That is a very, very interesting point. And I would like to now take this to the theme of the podcast, which is the education in unschooling and homeschooling families. Now, a lot of the folks that follow this podcast are unschoolers or homeschoolers, or at least looking into alternative types of education. And so obviously there's a lot of close contact with the child in the home. Now that allows the parent really to do things very differently and to take the time that perhaps a teacher with 30 students in the classroom, be it as it may, might have a harder time to actually take that time individually with each child. I don't know if any of you guys would like to chime in on how this type of parent-child relationship would be different perhaps in a homeschool, unschooling situation. Robin? <laughs> Unmute. Got it. I, I think what we're really talking about is 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 when you when you start to bring this possibility of um, the authoritative rather than authoritarian relationship into into a school situation, even in a classroom when there's one teacher and thirty kids, um, you you begin to talk about something that's nothing short of revolutionary, and that without uh, providing a kind of a model and a framework, then then um, you know it's it's frightening for uh, teachers turned in the tradition uh, trained in the in the traditional way to make that transition, because what happens is we, we, where we've come from and the uh, institutions we've come from, um, not all of us but a lot of us, most of us. There's when we think of um, uh, power and influence and authority, we have one model. And when somebody starts to say, you know, suggest don't be coercive, that gets very confused with not being assertive. Um, it gets very confused with, you know, and I have people ask me this question all the time. Um, people say, do you, do you mean just let the kids do whatever they want? Right? There's an image that if you don't use the old kind of power paradigm, there will be utter chaos and destructiveness in the universe. Um, and that's why I would want to say that, you know, in a sense, permissiveness is just the opposite um, flip side of the same problem of, um, uh, of being coercive, really. Uh, that maybe, maybe just to put it simply, what we're looking for is assertion rather than aggression. That's a simple way of, of putting it. So that whether you're in a teaching role or a parent or a grandparent, it's not about not being assertive. Uh, and and I liked, I loved the example that Sura gave. That you know she um, took great care of her grandson, and at the same time care of herself. She did say, "Look, I don't, I don't like in her own way. I don't, I don't like my my computer being injured. <laughs> my computer is important to me." And it took a long dialogue to come to that, but they both understood each other. Both had needs that were served. Both were respected. She did command respect as well as be very tender and respectful of her grandson. And, you know, bearing that in mind, that can happen in the classroom tremendously. Um, and it's exciting to see how well it can work. Um, two fundamental things. The first one is when, I mean, th this is going to be about revolutionizing 
the way schooling is done. It's fundamentally, mainstream schooling is fundamentally coercive. Even if you have a very, very, very nice teacher, it's fundamentally coercive because we're telling the children what they must learn, when they must learn it, and when they have to stop learning it because now it's time to move to another class. School continually interrupts the flow of your passion. We have school periods in Australia. Every 40 minutes you'll hear this you know, intrusive sound, bah, this horrible kind of siren bellowing. It's like an aircraft, uh, one of those air raid sirens bellowing across the school and you're jolted to attention and you run to another room to learn the next thing that you're supposed to learn. Um, the, the good thing, so that fundamentally the system itself is uh, invasive and coercive. How can you be democratic in that scenario? The, 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 the good thing is this is not just a philosophy or an ideology. There are many, many, many um, new and rapidly growing educational systems, whether it's in the homeschool scenario or in, in a school, in a school setting on, with a campus, where, where it's a, either a negotiated curriculum or an emergent curriculum that emerges from the passions of the children. And the children aren't all doing the same thing together in the room. The children are following their passion so that the teacher is a partner in the learning and a mentor rather than a boss or a controller. The result of that is that if, you, if you're really concerned about the academic result, it's good. It's at least as good as in an old-fashioned school. But far more importantly, um, on all behavior uh, kind of measures, it's far superior. Not surprisingly, bullying starts to plummet. Not surprisingly, teachers in that kind of emergent curriculum style of learning go from being one of the most stressed out professions to happy. The word love is used in the classroom. Instead of being somebody that the 50% of the kids in, in, in your room will be afraid of you, they love you and you love them. Teachers go home fulfilled and happy. Um, and to go even further, uh, th th this is a thought that I had um, as Teresa and Sura were, were speaking earlier about how important it is to continually reflect upon how our own childhood uh, affected us because so much of the time, uh, it, it, look, it's really useful to think of all of our children in our care as triggers, potentially triggers. When we have those automatic reactions that we're not happy with, that comes from somewhere. It doesn't mean we're bad people. It's just exactly what Sura said, that everyone's doing their best. What happens is that we've been triggered. There is implicit memory or body memory. And something emerges, something uh, spontaneously blurts from us that is right out of the script of our you know, some wounding of, of our childhood. If you look at that rather than as bad parental behavior, uh, but as um, a signal that a place where we, where it's like the wounded inner child, a place where we have been emotionally wounded has been triggered forward that is now asking for a healing process for the parent. And we can use that in terms of doing inner child work uh, often how we overreact or underreact or um, underrespond to our children is a sign that when we were roughly that age behaving similar to them, something in us was mistreated and that is looking for healing. So if you think along those terms, then being a parent or a teacher is a much larger thing than just uh, raising, loving, uh, uh, self-actualized children. It is also, it has a massive potential of becoming a personal growth and healing journey for the parent and for the teacher should you elect to, to use it that way. And you get 
a hundred opportunities each day because we get triggered so often. Is this possible in a school to work along those lines? Yes, I have seen it. I was invited to a school once um, where uh, once a week the teachers sit in circle and whoever is having difficulty with the child in their class would say it would be presented along the lines of this is the child that I'm currently having difficulty with. So already they're taking ownership. They're not saying this is the child with a the behaviour. They're not being diagnostic as is the norm in our cultures. They're not saying this is the, the child with the uh, behavioural disorder or, or the oppositional defiance, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're talking about what the child is bringing up for me. And then they, this is a confidential environment, highly emotionally safe by agreement and respectful. And the teachers will open up to each other and come to their truth. This is triggering some stuff for me about, you know, how powerless I felt with my school teachers at that age or with my parents or how angry I felt at that age. And there's something in, that is being provoked in me that wants some healing. When we go through that process in a supportive environment and we come to that intentional vulnerability that you were talking about, Miranda, there's immense value, uh, healing, support, and a community of teachers that gives us a new platform from which to understand the child we're working with from the inside. It's through understanding our own childhood that we get a deep, deep, like a body and visceral insight into now, this child in front of me, this is not just behavior. The behavior is some kind of a, a, a call for reconnection when the child feels disconnected. And now I can understand their need from the inside because they don't articulate their need. The behavior indirectly articulates, articulates their need. And that becomes something that we can address in the relationship. You betcha that can be done in schools as well as with ourselves, with each other, as, uh, you know, in partnership with parents. You know, uh, I'll just call it an inner child process. That is fantastically transformative, Robin. Sir, that absolutely is world changing and paradigm shifting. Now, because unfortunately not everybody in our world has lived that kind of relationship, I actually want to now go to a video of Teresa speaking with her son. And in that video, we're going to actually see what this type of communication is like. After that, we're going to talk to Teresa and she can illustrate some of these thoughts for us. Hi, Teresa from Parenting for Social Change here. And I'm excited because I have a special guest with me today. And this is Martel. How are you, Martel? I'm great. Martel um, is the first child who came into my life, and he has been um, tracking my videos and watching what I've been doing and knows about the book and the website. And uh, he decided that he wanted to be on a video with me so he could talk about his perspective about parenting and child-parent relationships. So Martel, could you talk about why you wanted to be on today? I feel like you mentioned me uh, enough and I want to actually show up there instead of you just writing about me. So you wanted people to get to know you a little bit better as a person mm -hmm. as opposed to just somebody that I write about? Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you really like to do? I really like hanging out with my friends and I'm a big gamer. And you're a big gamer. And Martel has his own YouTube channel. 008 Marcel. He's uploaded about over a hundred videos. Eight, oh, 108? 108 videos. And um, Martel, when, when you were first born, I was a pretty controlling parent. <laughs> Controlled a lot around food and what you watched on TV and different things like that. And you've taught me a lot about parenting and helped me to be a better parent. Um, what do you think about that? It makes me happy that you are just, me showing you this just makes it so you can show it to uh, many other parents and helps other kids. So what do you think is most important for parents to know about their kids and how they should treat their kids? They shouldn't be as controlling as a lot of parents are mm -hmm. because then the kids just want to rebel and rebel more so they should just let them 
be somewhat controlling, but not but not limit their kids at time. Okay. So so somewhat controlling would be okay. Like what kinds of things are okay from your perspective? I feel like you know like things that like people who are older should know like that should be you know more limited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like they should limitate things like you know food because they want this but they're not allowed to have it. Mm-hmm. And um how does it make you feel when you see parents treat kids um, with disrespect or they don't trust kids? What What do you think? It makes me feel bad and just sad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you could say one thing to parents about what it means to be a kid, what would that be? It's just hard and not fun. and just makes it feel like your parents don't love you. Mm-hmm. So when parents control their kids... Um, and Martel and I didn't rehearse any of this. We're just talking for the first time on camera. So when parents control their kids, um, sometimes parents will say, I'm doing this for your own good. I'm doing this because I love you. But you're, what you're saying is it doesn't feel like parents love you when they're controlling you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Not really. Okay. Thanks for joining me today, Martel. Do you want to say bye? Bye. Bye. So there is you, Teresa, and Martel talking with each other about a whole lot of issues in your relationship. And uh, I would love for you to share the background story on how that video even came to happen because I think it's such a beautiful example of the type of communication that we've been discussing. Sure. You know, I had, um, as I told my story earlier about when my partner had videotaped me, Martel at the time was getting close to about five years old. And we had also been in a lot of conflict because I, because he was beginning to push back against my control of him. And it showed up in a lot of different ways. And after I sort of had my aha moment and began shifting, um, you know, we had many conversations because as both Robin and Sarah have described, I often had to go back. I still have to go back as a parent and reconnect. And, um, you know, when I'm struggling and, um, you know, doing the best that I can, but it's not where I'd want it to be. But what had happened is I had begun writing and um, wrote my book and Martel knew that I was doing this and we were very open and I was very open and honest with him about my struggles as a parent and some of where it came from and what I was trying to do and also he knew that I was talking with other parents about it and he actually asked me to do a video with him because he knew I was doing videos and he said I want to be on a video and I want to talk about parenting and the parent-child relationship and our relationship and that's what led to doing the video because he knew I had been doing some and he said I want to do one with you. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. And I really, I love the fact that we had an opportunity to actually see how this kind of conversation goes because the reality is very few of us had parents who dealt with us that way. And some of us are starting to make the change, but it's a tough change because we really, as everybody said, haven't had those models. Now, on that note, I want to play devil's advocate with you guys a little bit. Uh, and I want to Reflect from the position of the parent who maybe hasn't had that aha moment that Teresa is describing. And so what do you do if you want to have this non-coercive, non-authoritarian, non-manipulative relationship with your child, but there are certain nutritional things that just aren't being met. And so we must eat fruits and vegetables. And this is also very important to the child's development because otherwise he's not going to be healthy in his future. And because we've read on how important nutrition is at this early age, then how do we get that child to now eat his fruits and vegetables? Well, Miranda, I'm happy to address that. And I'm sure Robin and others will chime in too. Um, you know, I up to that point with Martel, I'll just tell my own story as a parent, was that I was very controlling. Um, I controlled everything he ate, everything that came into the house, his access to media, just about every aspect of his life when I look back on it. And um, he also had um, a lot of food sensitivities and allergies, and he had eczema. 
And, you know, I don't know if that was the control showing up, <laughs> it's rebellion against my control or what, but, um, you know, a lot of the soul searching that I did myself was to begin to, to think about um, around food in particular, where I was triggered in lots of different ways from my own childhood with my mother. I had to think about what was most important. Did I, and I wanted Martel to not only have a positive relationship with me, but a positive relationship with food. And so I began to think about what does a positive, I did not have a positive relationship with food, but what would a positive relationship with food look like? And what would it look like to eat only when you're hungry, to eat what meets your needs, to not eat out of compulsion or eat out of rebellion or in whatever ways we're told to eat and what food represents, I think, in our, in my family. I'll speak about in a lot of the other families that I work with. Food represented so much more, and often it does. And my own reflections on my childhood and helping others see what that looks like and what the fear is behind that. And then thinking to myself, what do I really want? I want him to eat when he's hungry, not because I tell him, because his listening to his own body and understanding the impact was much more important than me dictating what I thought his body needed. Fantastic, Shara. Um, now, I don't want to limit this, or sorry, Teresa, I don't want to limit this just to nutrition. I mean, there are educational musts. He must read at this stage. There are behavioral musts. You cannot speak loudly in the theater. All of these musts that we want to make sure that our child is properly molded as to whatever it is that our beliefs are. Uh, Robin, would you like to speak to this? Uh, microphone. <laughs> we get so interested in what, what we were all talking about, we forget the essentials of microphones. Yeah, Miranda, I'm glad you asked that because that's, that's, that question uh, and that kind of question is something that I'm asked repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly um, whenever I go to work. And um, there are all kinds of musts and, and I, I actually agree with that. I do think that there are musts uh, when it comes to health and safety and all kinds of well-being. And, um, and, and that's why out of all of the workshops that I run with parents, the one that is always most uh, um, popular or most well attended is one that I call Connecting with Our Child. Um, uh, and the subtitle is, see that word connecting is central for me, right? The, the subtitle is um, um, Boundaries Without Punishment, Shaming or Manipulation. Okay, to put it simply, I think connection is what works. You, if you're really, really concerned uh, um, about your child having a, a really good diet, a really healthy diet, you're concerned about your child's body and well-being, and now we understand that diet is really, really important for, for healthy psychology as well because what's happening in, in the gut really, really impacts the, the heart and the brain phenomenally. Like uh, our gut is our third brain. So, you know, you'd want to be concerned about that. Um, controlling and forcing will lose you all of the influence that you, you thought you were going to have. Um, I think human beings treasure their sense of self over and above everything else, in a sense. We, we must have respect. And why did we think, why did we ever get the, the idea that, um, that there isn't, you know, something we can trust inside our child. They want something that's good for them. We can enlist that. We can connect with that place. So what creates the, the, the sense of connection that makes our relationship a collaborative one where our child will be naturally interested in what we have to say to them about food is um, it's a two-way street. It must begin with us respecting their right to have a pleasurable uh, and organically natural relationship to food. If we're just going to use food as the platform right now, to really respect their right to a pleasurable and natural relationship to food, that means um, eating when they're hungry, as Teresa was saying, not, not by the clock. 
Uh, it means you know, us eating together and having beautiful dialogue around that and the right to really be sensual around food, to take joy. That means you know, eating, you know, having a choice, having some choice to gravitate towards that which gives us pleasure. Right? Um, the, the other side of that is that if we want a child to be connected with us, is for us to speak from that intentional vulnerability not just to say, you eat this because it's good for you. That means absolutely nothing to a child. They will immediately resist that kind of statement. And, and who wouldn't? It's, it's um, cause it, so do we as adults. But if there's something that we're genuinely concerned about, and I am, I don't know about you, but I really am, I think we're being bombarded with, with um, you know, uh, from the, the vast commercial interest, us and our children are being absolutely bombarded with incredibly unhealthy stuff, uh, massive oversupplies of sugar and colouring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, you know the story. Um, I would want to express my what my fears are around that, and to trust and value my child's intelligence enough to bring them to that conversation. And children are interested; they open up when they feel that like they're not going to be pushed around basically. So through that connective sort of dialogue, we can bring in that part of the child that does want to pursue something that's holistically um, uh, healthy. And so, you know, that, that doesn't mean not, have, not asserting some boundaries. Um, it doesn't mean um, being utterly limitless. You know, that, that, that can be potentially kind of uh, when children receive no boundaries at all, no kind of intentionality from the parents, sometimes they end up feeling abandoned. You know, that was the permissiveness experiment, which didn't really, really work. So I don't know if I'm clear then, but uh, as I explain that, but I, I that's what I do in my workshops. I I show parents a kind of a framework for how they can be assertive and non-controlling around some of those musts. Um, but there's other things to take into consideration too. Be careful with what you think a must is. A lot of parents, that's when there's, we have to become well informed. A lot of parents, for instance, in Australia are absolutely wringing their hands with concern because their three-year-old is not reading whereas some of the smartest countries in the world won't even start your child reading until they're six or seven. Now that is a must. It is a cultural must. It is an industrial must. It is not a human must. Wow, the, the split between human musts and the musts that are culturally bound and culturally led and, and capitalistically culturally bound and culturally led is, is a huge, huge topic. Uh, and, uh, yes. I love the My, potential vulnerability that you discussed. That's a beautiful, beautiful phrase. Do you want to round it out, Robin, and then we'll go to Yeah, a, a couple of little thoughts to round that out. I, um, as parents, we're being coerced and pushed around a hell of a lot by commercial interests. It's them that we have to say no to, and you can be as controlling as you like with that. Go to your television and say to your television, stop it, right? Get out of my life. Watch a good movie on, 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 on uh, you know, one of the ways to stream a movie, but don't, but don't let commercial interests tell you how to have your family and, and what to feed your child. That you know, we draw a line in the sand and we say that stops here. Don't let commercial, large commercial interests tell you how a child uh, should be uh, educated. Uh, They're the people that we need to say no to, okay, uh, without necessarily having to offer an explanation. You just say no. <laughs> so I don't think the same rules apply for those big uh, in, in, uh, corporations as, as they do for our children. That but I really also wanted to say with the, with whole the whole other topic that we definitely yeah. need to go into because yes. Yes, please.
I, in yeah. fact, I think that as education is concerned, sometimes media literacy today and being able to read those corporate interests is actually a more important type of literacy, even just than the ABCs. Sura, I would like your thoughts on what we're discussing. I see you eagerly waving at us. Thank you. Yeah, again, so many. Um, um, yeah, going back to parents and when I meet with parents, I think for me, connection first, uh, I love that term also, like you, Robin. And for me, the point, the, my ability to connect with whoever I'm in front of increases my ability to express what's important to me and my values. This goes with parenting with children, and it also extends to, well, parents I meet with. So I really like to acknowledge and totally, I totally trust that parents uh, love their kids. They want the best for them, and it's such a hard job. And for me, empathy for the parents uh, comes first because parents are so striving for so much, and they want so much for their children, and, you know, they use, yeah. So I want to connect with that, and when someone especially comes with big energy around something that's so important to them, like diet or, well, video games and how much time kids are spending on video games or or education, um, are they studying enough? You know, all those worries parents have. I really like to take the time to connect with how important that is to them. Wow, this is really big for you, this idea of, you know, getting healthy food. And I'd love to hear more about that. What are the values behind that? What are your needs, you know? Well, I want my child to be healthy, and this is what I've learned about this and that. And I'll say, well, have you shared that with your child? And very often, the parents have only said, you know, you shouldn't eat that or that's too much video games. And they haven't shared the needs or the values behind what they're asking the child to do. So our teachers, they just tell kids to go to, you know, page 42 and do assignment seven. And they don't tell them why they're asking them to do that. And I think that's our responsibility as parents and teachers to communicate to the children why it is we're asking them to do what they do and uh, what we're telling them to do. So I mean, so I was just in China, and but this is not unique to China, but China's school system is uh, a lot of work. I mean, the kids go to school all day. They come home. They have three or four hours of homework. The children are often stressed and, I mean, really pushing back. And so parents were saying, well, how can I get my child to do his homework? I'd say, well, you know, tell me what, what is important about that to you. Because, again, it's not a universal need that children do homework at all. In my way of looking at things, it's a strategy for learning. Is it helping them learn? And I want to look at all that. Well, so the parents are caught in the system, too, trying to enforce what it comes down to it. They don't really see the value of it. And so we talk about that. And I said, well, I, I, I'm sure you can think of, and I can think of a lot of, the ways, a lot of ways to force your children to do homework. It's typically punishment or rewards. And to me, those gold stars you were talking about is the same system. They're, it's external motive, you know, manipulation to get the child to do what we want. And, you know, it's successful in the short term. Um, you know, take away their food, their dinner, and, you know, they might do more homework or something. But, but I said, do you want to spend your time trying to force in your child to fit into a system you don't think is serving their needs for learning and health and balance and a bunch of other things, or do you want to consider changing the system? Now that's a scary thing to even for me to even say in China. <laughs> I will have you know. So I'm careful about say, suggesting those things. But really, you know, what are we enforcing? What are we telling kids to do? Uh, one of the most inspiring public school teachers I have known, when it came to a third grade teacher, it came to it, there's just increasing testing going on in the U.S. They spend a lot of time teaching the kids how to take the tests and how to score because not only are the children scored on that, but the teachers are scored and oftentimes their salary is tied to the tests the children get, the test scores. So the whole system is, you know, and so this one teacher who believed that it was her responsibility to share with their students why it is she was asking them to do what she asked them to do. In some cases would say, you know, I, I will be honest with you, I don't see the intrinsic value of knowing this, what they're asking for on this test. 
And I will tell you this also, that the way the system is set up, getting a good score on the test may have some benefits for you. And these are the ones I think, you know, moving on to the next grade or getting, you know, a job in the system or that. But she was that honest with them. And then she, she helped them do the best she could to do well on the test because she saw some value in it, what she told them. And in some cases, these are third graders. She said, you know how I'm always asking you to think out of the box and think creative and, you know, stretch your mind to really come up with a, maybe a new idea about this subject? Well, in order to take this test, our puzzle, our challenge is to think inside a box, smaller than you usually think because that's what the test makers do when they make up these tests. And I'm going to help you to do that. If you want to go there, I will, let's, let's work on that. But that's, a, that's the challenge we have, you know. Um, so, you know, as parents and teachers, to me, that's our responsibility to be honest about why we're asking kids to do things and the value we see. And if we do that, then they may be more willing to listen to us than if we, just tell them, you know, not to eat the candy or, or don't look at video games or, you know, all the things pe parents tell them. Um, we connect with our needs around the subject. We ask them, what do you think about that? What comes up for you when I tell you what I've learned about nutrition and how important, you know, and how sugar impacts the way we think and behave? And I'm curious what your thoughts are when you hear what I've just told you. So then there's a conversation again. We're connecting and we're sharing information, and they get a sense we respect them. We're not just, and, and they'll listen to us, you know. When, when parents just tell kids what to do, interestingly enough, they, they don't come around that often. They, they don't really want to listen to us anymore, so we defeat the whole purpose of wanting to share our values in the first place. Sir, so. I think your comments um, so resonate because I think that, Often, you know, parents, as Robin said, and as you said, parents are pushed to conform, to also serve the systems by pushing students or children to conform in particular ways to the norms of that system. And so we have to even overcome our own um, training to be de deferential to authority, which we probably rebelled against at some point in our childhood and at some point gave into as we moved into adulthood. And I think it's so powerful to name what that system is and how it's operating and then how it can serve or not serve. And so that that really does engage children in a real and authentic conversation about what it is that this structure, these structures and systems do, not in a way to, um, you know, manipulate them, but just, just to be open about that, I think is such a powerful conversation. And I think it applies in so many different areas. And I also want to tag on to the comment you made about compassion for parents, because there's so much judgment and criticism. And, and I think that the fears that we have as parents about forging a different path, you know, about the concerns we have that are really important to us, the, um, you know, as you said, the self-judgment that we have of ourselves because we've been judged our whole lives in school systems, we've been graded in school systems in the same way that children are who are in school, and so I think that that compassion for um, understanding what might parents are fearful of, what it might push them to do, and to say that we're all in that learning process, I think is so critical because we're, we've all been in those same systems. We've all conformed in different ways or pushed back against it in different ways, had experiences where that was punished in different ways. And I think that we're in that in our own process as well. So I know I sort of rambled because you've covered so many great things, but I think, um, you know, that's just such a critical issue about how it is. It's it reminds me of when, you know, we often think children don't know what the rules are unless we tell them what the rules are and then force them to live according to those rules. But I've seen over and over both with the children in my life and other children who are really quite adept and socially aware about what the rules are when they go from one place to another. And we think we have to control them to do that, but in fact, um, they pay attention to those signals. 
and they're aware and they're always learning and taking in all of those kinds of signals. So when they are at our house versus when they're at their grandparents' house, there are different rules at the grandparents' house. We don't have to, you know, punish them to understand what those rules are. They, they know that. And if they want to be there, then they choose to be there and follow those rules because children are not antisocial. They're the opposite of that. And they want to um, be a part of those families and structures and communities. Robin, would you like to chime in on this? Yeah, it's, it's making me think this goes right back to the, the, uh, the beginning of our discussion about um, authoritarianism. And it reminds me when, when I think of the, the way schooling is done in, in mainstream schools in most parts of the world and not all. Um, um, and Sura was talking earlier on about how, uh, how hard they work the children in, in East Asian nations, extremely hard. Now, I've heard people say to me that in Korea, for instance, uh, kids in, in kindergarten are being given homework. And sometimes they're, you know, kids in early primary school working for 14 hours a day, several hours of homework every single night when they come home. And they have a really high suicide rate, a really abnormal, well, every suicide is um, horrific, but really super high youth suicide rate. Uh, and that's not surprising. Um, but it goes, to, to me, that speaks right to the heart of how little we trust children, how little we trust um, to use an old cliche, the power of love. Even in the face of all of the evidence, mountains and mountains of evidence, if you listen to somebody like Alfie Cohn, I'm sure you're a fan, Alfie Cohn from Harvard University, and he says it so well, and a lot of people say it, there is no evidence that homework helps. There is no evidence that homework helps. Homework does not help. Homework will not help. Homework is no use. It's worse than that. Homework causes trouble. Doing more is not necessarily doing better. It's been said so many times, and you can spend your life combing through all of the research studies. Homework does not help, except perhaps in senior high school. Up until then, leave it out. And here's the greatest irony, the greatest, greatest, greatest screaming irony. When children are supported to follow their passion, to do what they love, to learn in the way that they love to learn, don't say anything because they give themselves homework. Except it's not called homework. They're just learning what they want to learn. And, you know, in that self-driven way, driven by what they, loving what they're doing and being allowed to love what they're doing, they sometimes... You know, people say, oh, they never practice. If you don't practice, you won't get... But they, but they, but they just practice and practice and practice and practice and practice endlessly. So th then the parents' uh, concern is, will you please stop so that you can eat? Because you forgot to have dinner. Will you please... The problem then becomes, how do we stop them learning and studying <laughs> so that they can rest? And, you know, the, 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 the human passion for learning is intrinsic and it is utterly formidable. And then, what a cosmic joke. We think we have to push them and push them and push them or they will do nothing. We, 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 I think it behooves us to stop and ask ourselves, if I'm having to really push so hard for my child to learn, then what's up with what I'm doing here and what's up with the thing that I'm trying to foist upon them? If my child's not interested in learning this, or if this child in my class is not interested in learning, what's up with what I'm giving the child instead of blaming the child? That's it. Sarah, do you want to speak to that? I see everybody waving about and cheering because these talks have been so exceptionally, yeah, I mean, I, we're all in big agreement. Everybody's giving big thumbs up. Sarah, I think that you've got some thoughts you'd like to add. Well, it blows my mind, really, because uh, anyone who observes a young child learning to talk or learning to walk, falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up, poking around, taking things apart, I mean, they're, that's all they're about is discovery and learning and play. And those are all kind of like the same for them, I think. 
And you can't stop them from learning, it seems to me, until you start telling them what to learn, when to learn, you know, and how to learn it, and how much they should learn, and how they compare with other people's learning. And so, you know, it's just tragic to see five-year-olds now in the school system saying things like, I'm dumb, I'm not good at math, I'm stupid, and, and when they don't start out that way. And it's like that the, the assumptions about being bad children. I mean, I saw this, that assumption. I went to see a two-week-old baby, a friend of mine. And I, I was excited, went to their house, rang the doorbell. The mother comes out and says, oh, it's too bad you come now. She's really being bad. I'm going, she's two weeks old. What do you, you know, what is she talking about? The baby's crying. The baby's expressing itself in the only way. So... To me, to have these assumptions about human behavior, well, sometimes it just points to me that those of us who have learned in this authoritarian system that the authorities know best will, you know, bypass what we see is misery in our children. You know, parents know when their children are miserable and they feel it, but they are believing that the authorities at the school know best about how much the child should learn, how far behind they are, all that stuff. And so we are, as parents, the enforcers of the culture. Or we have the opportunity to be the creators of a new culture based on what we actually observe and experience and the love that we feel for our children. So I think putting, you know, really supporting parents to, to be, you know, to go by their gut. How's your child doing? Is, is your child thriving? Do you, you know, is this helping? What do you think? And uh, that's part of it, and getting parents to really think about it. Um, yeah, because children want, you know, they, it's our nature to learn. So uh, really looking at that. There was one other thing. Um, oh, so many things that uh, you all have said that really sparkle. Oh, I guess just this. I have been spending a, a fair amount of time in China recently because well, I don't know. I don't know. That's where I'm called to go. And um, the, it reminds me of the 60s over there right now and a sort of a surge of personal growth and this free enterprise and business, which leads people to think about other kinds of freedom. And for a culture that has not known a lot of, you know, has known a lot of authoritarian structures, it's kind of blown my mind to see how quickly uh, these ideas of trusting oneself, of democracy, where, which I interpret as caring about everybody's needs equally and the fact that we all like to participate in how things go, especially rules and things that affect us. People seem to want to have a say in that, to matter, to have their needs matter. And I see people who didn't grow up with that awareness just resonating with these ideals. And uh, that's really that's really hope building for me. And even in this matter of schools, back in the 60s when we started to see homeschooling and alternative schooling to the one-size-fits-all government schooling, that's, I see that happening there. There are new schools. There's people starting to do homeschools. Just, it's a scary thing in some ways there. And yet people are really resonating with these ideas. And that, that's certainly a testament to the human spirit in my, in my experience. Yeah. Sora, so one of the things that you um, mentioned, both when you were thinking about when you reflected on China, but also in, in the earlier part of what you said, was trusting ourselves. And I think, uh, you know, when we're within these authoritarian paradigms, we give up trust in ourselves to trust authority. And so as parents, once we become adults and we become parents who want to be in this partnership mode, a, a paradigm um, and as facilitators with children, we are in that process of learning to trust ourselves again, to trust our intuition, what we see, what we observe, you know, and to not override that by what someone else, some system or authority is telling us is the right thing. And I think that is um, such an important part of our process as parents is to, to recognize that we've lost trust within ourselves um, and that we can regain that and we can reconnect 
to our judgment and our trust and our intuition. And I think that's such a powerful, like it's an individually powerful process. And then as you talk about what's happening in China, it's a collective process, you know, cultural process as well, that I think is not only happening there, but in some of the other, you know, in other places as well. And I think that is really hopeful about what it is that we can do. Thank you, Teresa. Now, I want to go to Robin for a second because we've got a chat, for those of you in the audience, we've actually got a chat where we are uh, commenting as everybody else is talking. And Robin is talking to me about democracy in schools and how this is essential for creating a democratic society. And I have to go back to devil's advocate a little bit here with you, Robin, and I have to ask if the system, in quotes, as such, really wants a true democratic society. And so I turn this over to you with a little bit of a, a devil's advocate side on that. I think the system has its, its foot on the brakes about democracy. And, you know, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a uh, I guess, a student of democracy, a fan of democracy. I, I, uh, I have a little bit of religious fervor about democracy and what I want to say about democracy, it's not on or off like a light switch. It's an evolutionary process and that the qualities of democracy that we have in countries like the United States and Australia are what I would consider to be a primitive early uh, dabbling with democracy. So we're, we're, there's some exciting, I think, democratic institutions that we have, but we know we're nowhere near what we could have in terms of uh, a, a fully participatory democratic society. Um, uh, no, look, that's too long a conversation in terms of political science, etc. cetera. But um, the, the main thing that I researched in, 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 when I looked at my first book, Parenting for, uh, when I wrote my first book, Parenting for a Peaceful World, is a psychohistorical research um, in which we look at how whenever there is a quantum leap forward in democratic process in any nation or society, that follows on from um, changes, child rearing reforms, changing uh, the, 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 the parenting and educational um, customs one generation or two generations earlier. The same for any troubles in the world, whenever you see war, dictatorship unfolding, the first question to ask is how were the children or a, a critical mass of children customarily treated in that region of the world one and two generations earlier? And the links are, are so uh, strong that to me the, um, it's not that child rearing and education is the only tool of social evolution but it is one of the strongest ones. It's absolutely fundamental. What we do with our children will show up in the politics of the nation, uh, and I think that's absolutely inevitable. So looking at our classrooms in the mainstream education, no, I think that it mitigates against democracy. And I don't think democracy is you do what you want. Democracy is not a freedom, it's a responsibility. Well, it's not a freedom any more than it is about responsibility and connectedness. It's about our voice, not just our freedom to express our voice, but our responsibility to uh, express our voice in a, in, an, uh, um, in a connected, socially connected way that's, that's caring and responsible. You know, I, I don't usually get what I want when I vote, but my, my voice is really, really heard. Okay, uh, that's the way I like to think of democracy. Does that happen in the classroom? Can we stand up in the classroom and say, look, I have some questions to ask you, uh, teacher. I, I really don't agree with where you're coming from. Well, that's all very well, but, you know, that won't help you in the test tomorrow, okay? So just go back to that. Um, how often can we say in the classroom, look, teacher, I'm really not interested in, in, in studying geography right now. And, uh, not that aspect of it. I want to do my own thing, okay? And I'm really passionate about, you know, uh, learning about what happens to volcanoes, under undersea volcanoes. Um, how often does that happen? Does that, it's impossible. It's impossible. So we, can't, we cannot contribute from the best that is ourselves in a school community. We have to wait up until it stops. 
And then kids are expected to suddenly become democratic beings. You know, if we didn't have compulsory voting in Australia, we would get the same thing as in the States where most people don't go out to vote. You know, people disengage. We blame the government instead of, you know, we treat the government as the big school teacher in, 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 the, in the parliament house or the big mommy or daddy in the parliament house. What we do is we blame, but we don't see ourselves as mature agents of the way that a society operates. And I, I think that school has a lot to answer for in terms of its seriously undemocratic styles of, of, uh, of education. And when I look at the way that, um, say, democratic, the democratic schools of Israel operate, they are utterly magnificent. They say, look, we won't start teaching you stuff up until you learn who you are. And that's going to be uh, um, mainly sitting in a circle and we'll talk about ourselves to each other. And uh, they have a, a um, democratic education tertiary institution that teachers learn in Tel Aviv. They learn how to be democratic instructors and they run these democratic schools where the kids learn what they want to learn, how they want to learn. Now, I've met young people that have gone to those schools all their life. They are, I think that they are a quantum leap ahead in terms of a sense of maturity, a sense of agency, a peaceful way of speaking, um, a sense of internationality, of being part of, a, of an international community in a global village, and a sense of connectedness to the, to the non-human world as well. Now, that's something that, if we think about it, that's exactly what we all want. But we do, we will have to update our education systems um, because not everybody wants to or can homeschool. So here's a difficult question then. What needs to happen? Can you give specifics on what needs to happen within the school systems? Because, yeah, not everybody wants to or can homeschool. Again, we yeah. have systems that we all live within, and that's part of yes. the people cannot make that choice. But yes. uh, barring that, what, what, what can we do within the school systems? Good news there, Miranda, really good news. It can be done. It is being done. Uh, it's kind of a retooling that is perfectly possible. And a central paradigm that is very, very useful is the uh, this emergent curriculum. Now, kids will still learn all of the things that they need to learn to be powerful in the world. Uh, but there's a little bit of retraining of teachers, which will be necessary because you can no longer show up to the classroom with the same photocopied sheet and just hand it out to everybody and, and expect everybody to do the same stuff. Initially, it's hard work because it requires a teacher to be very, very, very observant of each individual child. And when you find the things that really switch on the, child, the children differentially, to then to offer them those opportunities. When that starts to happen, when we get to know the children, then the thing just starts to roll by itself like a natural process like a breeze, and then the teacher can be more like a passive uh, and relaxed partner and mentor, where the children come to you hungry, right, with their questions, but they become far more self-driven. They will, and they do, assign themselves homework, but it's not called homework. They're just having fun with what they're learning. This is being done. I've got so many examples I could tell you. There are about 25 uh, in the Catholic school, primary school system in, in Sydney. There's now about 25 of them that retooled and taught their teachers how to teach in this emergent curriculum style. They have people from Macquarie University in Sydney very carefully measuring the results. They're finding that academically they're doing just as well as they were before, if not a little bit better. But as I was saying earlier, that the, uh, the incidence of bullying in all of those schools, the in, in, in incidence of um, you know, disruptive behavior and violent behavior really drops off the charts. And the, and the teachers are a lot happier. So successful is that system that they have started to export it. People are becoming very, very enthusiastic about it. They all want a piece of it. They have started to export that to other schools within the Catholic system. Uh, now, what's very exciting for me is that I'm a psychotherapist. I've been working as a psychotherapist for 25 years and half of my clients were coming to me with Catholic trauma from having gone to Catholic schools. That does not have a good name. And 
you look around the world, it's not just true in Australia, that's true around the world. Those have been very violent places, not completely, but there's been a lot of it. Um, these Catholic schools, you know, I would, if I'm ever going to have a grandchild and my grandchild wants to go to one of those Catholic schools, I would take them there every morning myself and very happily. Beautiful environment. So it's not just, it, it, look, there's so many examples where this is unfolding around the world. They all have different names, the emergent curriculum, the democratic schools. In Japan, we were talking earlier about East Asia. In Japan, there's the free school system, which uh, was a reaction to that pressure cooker, uh, uh, excessive, um, heavy homework, hard work, testing, testing, testing kind of system of the Japanese schools where kids were breaking down and there was a nationwide epidemic of school refusal, kids just locking themselves in their rooms and never coming out, and a tremendous epidemic of some of the worst bullying that you can imagine. So people started taking the kids out of school. Uh, they Got the, they invented the free school system just to put their, their damaged children in and they said, look, you can study what you want and we'll let you study how you want to and we'll just be here to help. Now they have over 200 of those. And um, they've become a lobby that the government in Japan is starting to listen to. They have wonderful results and several years ago I heard that those children finishing high school thinking, look, we don't have universities in the country. Um, that, that teach along these lines. What can we do? Because we all, a lot of us want to study university. You know what? We'll make our own university. And they did. Now, if that's not democracy, if that's not a thrilling uh, evidence of democracy, I don't know what is. And imagine what those kids would do in, in government or when they start to, to, to vote and, and influence the direction that government takes. I think democracy and peace, world peace begins in school or in, in at home, depending on where the kids are. So, Robin, when I hear you talk about all of the places that this new emergent alternative education is happening, I feel really excited and encouraged. And it's one of the things I think, you know, a lot of parents, especially the ones you were, you were talking about, um, Miranda, maybe, who aren't aligned yet with our vision or, or of how parenting can be, but or education, people need to hear what's possible. Oftentimes we only know what we've seen. And so to hear the st kind of stories you're telling, Robin, and the success and the learning that's happening in these very, you know, new ways to many of us, I think is super important to um, wake up our curiosity and sense of imagination about what's possible. And then and then the other thing, and I'm kind of going back to a question you asked a really long time ago, Miranda, about, you know, what what's a different parenting roles when you're homeschooling or not homeschooling? And I really can't think of a difference in how uh, I would like to see parents be with their children. It's, again, an, an honesty about how are we doing, kids? And is my child thriving and really looking at that and are their learning needs really being met and really looking at what's right in front of their eyes and always in their heart, their just urgent longing for their children to thrive. And when they're not, take a look at, you know, what's helping their thriving and what's, what's not. And if the schools are not, then to start speaking up about that. And that's where I see the change happening, I think, the power lies with the parents. Teachers are teachers are caring, but they're very busy in the system, and um, they don't have the long-term um, motivation that parents have to make sure those kids thrive. So, for me, getting parents talking with each other about how it's really working in the schools and what they'd like to see different, what they like about it, what they don't—that's where the power lies for the change. And then, you know, to look around and see what other schools are doing is to look at what, what change could look like for them. Um, power of the people, really. And uh, that's where I see the change happening. It's not liable to start from the top of this power structure. <laughs> it's going to start with the people who uh, care about it the most. And I think that's the parents. And just being honest, not even having to have a whole lot of 
new ideas, but to say something's got to happen because this isn't working for my child. And more and more parents are certainly saying that everywhere I go. So I, I take a lot of hope in that. And my encouragement to parents, is, again, is to be honest, to speak with each other, to start to look at uh, what you want for your children because they're your children. <laughs> they're not the school's children. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting, again, to see all the places that's taking us into new forms of education. Yeah. That's tagging on. <laughs> that is absolutely inspiring and fantastic. And we're actually coming close to the end of the podcast. And I love that we're leaving on such an absolutely inspiring uh, tone. Now, before we do leave, I want to give each one of you three, well, first of all, a big thank you for your time, but I want to give you guys an opportunity to give us some closing thoughts. Now, if in those closing thoughts you can possibly work in some tool for parents or for teachers, as well as the inspiration that you've been already sharing with us, I would much appreciate that. And perhaps we could start with Teresa. Oh, I was going to say, start with someone else. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm very happy to flip to somebody else. Though. I was so uh, thinking about how great a conversation it was and how much I've really enjoyed um, being in this exchange and how I actually feel more hopeful after it, even though I'm always in that place of hope. But to hear the ways in which I think each of us approaches the central idea about that parent-child relationship as really being the foundation for how we want the world to be. And that we have power, even though we don't often feel like we do, in the face of so many other things, whether it's media, uh, large corporations, school systems, we absolutely can claim back and reclaim the power that we have to not only transform our relationships with children, but also to influence the ways in which institutions and systems operate with children and to be those voices and advocates, not only for our individual children that are in our lives that, that we have responsibility to, but also for other children um, who may not have that same foundation and advocates for them within systems that they're a part of. So I actually feel very hopeful and believe that, you know, it is at the core and how we treat children does then reflect outward in our culture and our society and our systems, even though it may be slow over time, change is happening and I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. Thank you. I love that. Sir, would you like to chime in at this point? Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, I want to echo what you said, Teresa, about this rich conversation we're having and this being a vehicle for change uh, that Miranda and Anne and others have convened here to talk about what we want for our children and the, the power and the responsibility and the joy that parents have in, in uh, spending our lives with children and caring about them and how we can do that ever better because we're all just learning as we go. You know, in that regard, I sometimes I'm super uncomfortable when people call me an expert. I'm someone who's just been on this path along and I, a long time and I, I really care about it. So, um, but I'm always learning too. I'm learning from these conversations and everywhere I go and talk with parents, it's a learning opportunity for me about what our challenge is as parents. And, and especially now um, in an age that's different than when I raised children with the technology challenges and I mean it's 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 a very different time and and but what's the same is our love our care for our children and wanting them to thrive so I think I'd like to leave um, you with my favorite question to ask as a parent and as a teacher with young people even very young children you know here we are we get to spend our lives together or maybe this year together as a teacher and students, and I want to have the conversation about how do we want to live and learn together? How do we want our classroom to be? How do we want our home to feel? Does everyone want to feel respect? Do we all want to be heard when we talk? You know, what are the things that, how do we create this space? Because we've never been here before. And um, that question to me is the most important one I I can think of at this time. I might have a new favorite tomorrow. But um, for me, that's the most important 
question in a classroom. It's more important to engage that conversation and hear the voices of all the children or at home with our children, our spouses or whatever, to, to really see how to create the environment that, that we want. And uh, that's exciting to me. That's uh, learning, playing together. It's the true meaning of cooperation. I think it has to do with democracy too. How do we bring all our voices and all our needs together and find strategies, find ways to really serve all of us? And um, yeah, so I think I'll just leave, leave with that question. Thank you very much, Sura. Now I want to give Robin a chance to give his last parting words. I'm just I'm filled with emotion of how powerful this is because I really truly, reflecting what all of you are saying, think that this is one of the ways that we can change the world. Robin. Yes, thank you, Miranda. Three things that I would like to uh, leave you with. Um, you know, there's so much uh, thinking and talking, I think, in our world now that, you know, everywhere you look, there's a parenting book. <laughs> and I'm guilty of having uh, uh, written one. And uh, two, um, it, there's, there's so much thought about being good parents um, and, and what to say to our children. Um, I, uh, a favorite idea um, uh, for me is to think not just what to say to our children, but what questions to ask. And I love, I love, I love the power of questions. As long as we don't just ask a question and leave, but ask a question uh, and, and really, really, really listen. Questions like, how did that feel for you when this happened with our children? Um, or questions uh, like, what did you really want when you were doing that and were you, were, when you were saying this? It is so moving. Uh, uh, their biggest drive is to be heard. And all of the so-called good behavior comes as a result of that. In the classroom, the most important question is, what do you love? What do you love? Why don't we ask that every day? What do you love about that? And why do you love that about that? What a wonderful invitation that is so that the heart remains present in the way that we learn. Why, why isn't learning, why isn't the word love, here's a question, why isn't the word love the most frequently word, used word in the, in the classroom or in any learning situation? Um, the next thing I wanted to say is there's, there's, there's a lot of concern and I think anxiety in our world now as we turn so much attention to child development and all the things that could go wrong and brain development. We know so much more about what can go wrong. And then there's the, the, the um, in our anxiety, we reassure ourselves with the idea of the good enough parent. And I want to say that there's something much larger than that, uh, which is, you know, sometimes we're good enough, sometimes we're more than good enough, we're magnificent, and sometimes we're just not. Okay, sometimes we just suck. All right. What our children mostly need is that we be learning parents, not just good enough. Learning parents with a, with a continual humility, uh, with taking ownership of the things that we do and a continual humility of, and an interest, a love of learning. I want to learn to do that better. I'm not happy with how I did that. That wasn't my good parenting day. I want to learn to do that better. This is my growth for me as well as for my family and for my country, for my people, my global village. So the learning parent, the learning teacher. Um, like you said, Sura, we're not experts. We're learners. We have some expertise, some fantastic expertise, actually, and if you ask me, I'll share it with you. But I'm, I'm learning. Let's celebrate that that means getting things wrong. Let's see you know, the usefulness of failure, the wonderful usefulness of failure. So uh, that means as a learning parent, um, as a learning psychologist, if you like, uh, my commitment is not to teach from what I've done right any more than teaching from what I've done wrong. You, as my human family, are entitled to that information about me. The, the messes I've made, the mistakes I've made, so that that can be of use to you. 
in in our collective quest to to be better people yeah um and lastly use your voice be a lobby collect with other parents D demand the policies that you want from your school be a little bit difficult um it works perfectly the other way there's always parent groups that come to annoy the teacher and say you're not giving my child enough homework right how come we can't push in the other direction and um and to do so respectfully to do so with the i statement that this is what people like marshall rosenberg taught us that's where our power is not in pushing and coercing anyone but but telling our truth i don't need my child to do homework i don't believe in homework i support my child in not doing your homework okay we can do that um our government in australia for example imposed this disastrous standardized exams that they shove to all the children in this it's the same test in every single primary school and high school in the whole country if you read the fine print no one is obligated to do it it's not even hard to be a conscientious objector there is no punishment so we just quietly said to our school our daughter does not need to do will not attend the your your nap plan it's called the nap plan i don't even know what it stands for i don't want to find out our daughter will not attend the nap plan exam and you know what the teachers none of them like it none of them believe in it the government believes in it none of the teachers do so be a lobby and and ask for what you want that's how we change things that's democracy that's that's democracy don't wait until you get given a vote in november you vote with every exhalation through the way that you live and that's something that we do together and thank you i really really enjoyed being with you guys today it was wonderful i always think of a million things that i wish i'd said afterwards <laughs> That's why you write books, right? <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Sarah. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. I have loved being part of this conversation. I, I sincerely thank you for your time and I thank you for the inspiration both as a parent and because I know that this is going to be out there for other parents to share and to see. And I know that these little ripples that we make are part of a big, big, big change. So thank you guys all for your time, your research, your books, and your love and your passion that you've shown today. Uh, this has just been an absolutely fabulous, fabulous conversation full of insight. I also want to thank the Conscious Consumer Network and our producer, Ann Boy, for putting this show together. I want to remind all the guests that you can look up information on Robin, Teresa, and Sura on our webpage at theconsciousconsumernetwork.net. Look for the show notes on episode 63, which is this episode, so that you can connect back with them, so that you can see more and learn more about their work and what they're doing and follow along with them. And in the words of Lainey Liberty, the regular host here on the podcast, wherever you are, whatever you do, remember to do it for the love of learning. Conscious Consumer Network was designed to create a live broadcast TV network for free and independent media and has been live on the air since the 1st of January 2015. CCN gets millions of minutes watched every month and is viewed in over 140 countries, having produced around 1,400 shows and counting. And, and you know, it's very hard to get on the mainstream media, of course, the corporate media that's getting tighter and more monopolized and more restrictive for any outside information. The live broadcasts are free to view and all shows are archived in high definition on YouTube. CCN plays host to a stellar team of broadcasters and producers, all of whom rely on the network to get their message and information out to the world. CCN has continued to evolve, constantly seeking to create greater media usage and opportunities for both broadcasters and viewers 
including supporting projects such as the newly launched ConsciousCommunities.org, a brand new social media platform that is free to use and has been created for those dedicated to the pursuit of freedom, justice, peace and sustainability to come together and co-create the solutions to a better world. Due to the constant heavy usage, we are in need of replenishing and replacing of key hardware and infrastructural wear and tear. This includes the fixing and replacing of parts of the live broadcast equipment system, as well as increasing storage capacities for content and projects. Without this, CCN and its affiliate projects will simply not be able to continue. Conscious Consumer Network is a publicly funded project and it is up to you all to keep CCN on the air. Support our funding drive with a donation or become a monthly pledger. We thank you all for supporting free and independent media.